So here it is, the cheapest Porsche 718 Cayman S in the whole entire country. And this is what it sounds like. <laughs> it's not the most healthiest of sounding things. And it's also not the most healthiest of looking things in the UK either. Now in the last video I explained to you guys that I bought this Porsche from auction and I was the only bidder. This car didn't even meet its reserve price. But at the cost of £18,500, I still don't think it's too bad of a deal. I think it looks a lot worse than it actually is. Well, I hope it looks a lot worse than it actually is. Now, I think the part that puzzled us the most with this is we couldn't work out how every single panel on this car has been damaged. But I think I found part of the reason and it's not actually from the accident. Now, we sort of figured out that there was some sort of impact on this passenger side for the door card airbag to blow and also the seat airbag to blow on that side. But alongside that, we have a window smashed on this side, a window smashed there. We have roof damage, we've got rear quarter damage, we've got boot damage. We even have rear bumper damage as well along the bottom here. I also had an obliterated windscreen which has been removed, no driver's side wing mirror, a severely damaged driver's side wing and headlight, the passenger side front wheel is battered, the passenger side A pillar is battered, the driver's side rear quarter is gone and there's no driver's side side skirt. But check out this door, I can't believe I didn't notice this before. Now other than this mark and this pretty severe hole and dent, this door would have been actually okay and it was quite hard to work out what actually caused that and if you look at it from here this line is pretty evenly spaced along with this line here which is the same space as that line there and then it looks like it's been dragged all the way down and it's the same for the side skirt the two lines there and the two lines there and that side skirt would have been completely fine if it wasn't for these two lines some of you have probably already guessed where that damage just came from but bear with me now the back bumper would have been completely fine but yes you guessed it if it was wasn't for the two lines running down here, this broken part there, and again, the two lines running down there with the broken part there. There's one more. Here is the driver's side door, which again would have been completely fine if it wasn't for the same type of lines which have pierced a hole and rubbed all the way down the door there and down here as well. All of these damages are way too uniform to be caused by the crash. So what did cause them? Now this Porsche was bought from Copart and any guesses what they use to move around salvage cars at Copart? You guessed it, a forklift. But hey, either way, it doesn't change the fact that I still bought this car and I still have to repair it. And it's not like there was hiding anything. All of the damage were shown on the pictures at the auction. But I'm just a little miff that the car could have been in a little bit better condition if there was some careful forklift driving. Now I say I've got to repair this Porsche. I am still on the edge. And at the moment, all I've paid for is the car. My goal right now is to strip the car apart and work out what parts are salvageable and what parts need replacing. Just like this wheel. The first thing that was coming to my attention was the noise that comes from just in front of the driver's side wheel when the car's on. It sounds like a fan is almost catching on the arch lining. And then I since found out it wasn't catching on the arch lining, but it was catching on a lot of mud and stones. It seems the Porsche has definitely crashed into some kind of muddy ditch or field to Hannah's disliking. But other than that, inside the driver's wheel well, everything seems to be in pretty good order. Although it is difficult to tell whether any of the suspension is damaged until it's been on a wheel alignment. Next off is the front bumper. I know that this isn't salvageable, but I'm hoping that there's no damage behind it. And my hopes were soon shattered because, well, there was a lower crash bar which was completely bent. I'm moving swiftly on to the driver's side front wing and headlight. Both of these are completely battered and definitely need replacing. Again, more hopes that there's no damage behind this wing. 
But this time, all seems well. By now, you've probably realized that I'm used to buying cars with some hidden surprises. But yes, I know it can feel absolutely painful when buying a car that you thought on the outside looks completely mint, but then finding out it has some Quack. terrible history. What? No way! And that's why before buying a car, I always check it out using Car Vertical, who have sponsored today's video. Now, Car Vertical works in over 20 different countries and it gathers data from pretty much everywhere to make sure the car that you're buying is as advertised. Check this out. Here's a report I did on a Porsche Panamera. At the top, you can see I've got a green tick to show that there's been no mileage fraud, a green tick to show that it's not been recorded as stolen, but an amber light to show that it's been recorded as being in an accident, and a green tick to show there's no outstanding finance. As I scroll through the report, I can see when the damage was detected, which was in May 2017, and then it was put on sale in June 2017. As I scrolled further down the report, I can see that all the mileage all lines up, which is good, but then here's the juicy part, the damage. I can see this car was a category D write-off. And what's even better than that, as I scroll further down, I can see all the pictures of when the car was damaged and auctioned off at the car crash auction website. But just to show you what a good report looks like, here's a report on my BMW M3. All green ticks at the top, all the mileage all lines up, and there's no reports of it being damaged. So to check your car, a friend's car, or a car that you're potentially about to buy, you can click the link in the description box below. And with my link, you're going to save yourself a bit of cash as well. That's car vertical. So that's the front end completely apart. And there's only sort of one real hidden surprise, which I didn't expect is the front lower crash bar here, which is all bent up, but it's not too much of a drama because I did find one on eBay for 150 pound plus seven pound 50 postage. So it's not too bad at the minute. So, so far it's not really cost us anything because I'm still on edge on whether this thing's actually worth repairing or not. And there's a few things that's gonna decide that. So here's the driver's side wing, which is good to know one. It's also the headlight bracket and then the headlight as well. That's completely, obliterated and again that's going to be good to absolutely no one and we all know how expensive headlights can be the passenger side wing probably could be salvageable it's not too bad but then we have the passenger side headlight as well looks in okay condition it all works there is a few scratches on top i don't know whether we'll maybe be able to get them out i don't think it's worth replacing the passenger side headlight just for those scratches but for a driver side headlight we're looking around 900 pound and that's second hand we knew it was going to be expensive but I don't think that was it's not too bad But I'm not going to be pulling the trigger on any of those parts just yet There's two things I want to be 100% sure about before I do the rear quarter is replaceable We know that and it's not actually classed as structure for the car It's just basically like a beauty panel almost it's covering over the structure of it and in my opinion The rear quarter doesn't look so bad. It doesn't look like it's pushed anything underneath any of the inner rear quarter or anything like that but running along all down here and underneath the a pillar is the structure of the car and you can just see the structure there and if that structure which is underneath this a pillar is bent twisted or sort of pushed in in any way well the car's probably not worth repairing and the only way for me to find out whether that is damaged is to remove the a pillar skin now this is one huge panel and you can see here all the spot welds which are holding it to the actual frame of the car but I'm not gonna be spending my time drilling all of those out just to find out it's damaged. So for now, I'm getting the angle grinder out to cut a little window in the A pillar so I can see if there's any damage behind it, which fingers crossed, there isn't. And the first incision was made it's looking like good news. So as expected, underneath the actual A pillar, it looks as if the actual chassis of the car is all in one piece and there's no bends in there. There is a tiny, tiny little dent there, but I cannot see that little dent putting out the whole chassis of the car. It is the tiniest little surface dent, but I could see why maybe an insurance company would probably category S it because of that but it's been category end, which is non-structural. So, so far, so good. So for once, we can actually take a positive from the Porsche, but there's still more. 
So another thing I wanted to be 100% confident about before throwing a lot of money and a lot of time at this Porsche is the engine. I want to make sure that this engine runs to temperature and is all good because if it's no good, then that just adds to further cost, further repair and further labor, which again, we are working on fine margins with this car. Now we know that the Porsche starts and runs at the moment. It does sound a little bit tappity, but a few of you guys mentioned in the last video, that's just how these 2.5 liters sound. The thing is we haven't ran the car to temperature and the only reason we haven't is because it doesn't hold coolant and it doesn't hold coolant because this radiator right at the front here is just smashed to bits. So all the coolant just leaks out of here. On this side, you've got an aircon condenser. Behind that, you've got the actual coolant radiator. And then behind that, you've got the coolant fan and it seems a similar story on the driver's side but if we can get the Porsche to hold coolant then we can run it to temperature then we can find out whether this engine is all good to go but this is where the expense starts inside this box here is a brand new second-hand radiator pack including the aircon condenser the radiator and the fan believe me I looked everywhere for the best price but this ended up costing me 1200 Pounds. Painful. So a big low blow from the Porsche there, but that's not going to stop me from continuing. It seems again we're rebuilding a car which shares a few badges with other brands. Maybe this will come in help in the future. But right now we've got the old radiator and fan off the car and it's time to put on the new one. The £1,200 one. All of this was pretty easy to install because it's really accessible with that front wing and the arch lining out. I just had to remove that lower bent crash bar to put that intake duct on. Okay, radiator, aircon pipes, and fan all on. It's not the most stable thing at the minute, and that's because the top bracket, which sits, well, at the top, the spot welds, as you can see there, have pulled out from the actual frame of the car. But when Mark comes and helps me weld on the side of the quarter, when we get to that point, we should be able to re-weld this back on, and it should be nice and sturdy. So now, really, it's the moment of truth. I've got some uh, coolant here to pop in there then we can run the car up to temperature i have no idea where the expansion tank is on this car obviously the engine being mid-engine or in the back i don't know whether it's going to be under this carpet a quick google will probably solve that and with the coolant as well i've also got some uh, oil and oil filter because this car like loads of new cars doesn't have a dipstick so there's no way of me really checking the oil and i don't really want to run the car up to temperature with low oil. I assume a light would come on the dashboard if you did have low oil, but the only way of checking it is running it up to temperature, then it will give you a oil level. So I might as well just change the oil, then I know the right amount of oil is in the car. So let's figure out <laughs> how to get to all of that. Yep. Ah. And oil. Ah. Can I just say, I found that. Matt's gonna take you <laughs> <laughs> So after Chris found where to top up the coolant and where to top up the oil, I began topping up the coolant. Yes, without a funnel, but I've got skills. But it turns out later on, I was wrong to do this. But before we get onto that, we pop the car in the air, ready to drain the oil from the Porsche. And even this became a challenge. Okay, there's a slight issue on this ramp here. Um, the actual sump is underneath that under tray there and I can't remove that because this ramp is just awkward as anything and well the way the car is at the moment I still have to start it to get it into the big ramp so we might as well start this and run it up to temperature with the old oil in it's not ideal but I feel like if it does have low oil there'll be a low oil light on the dashboard we're putting trust in that so with the trust in the electronics of the car, I started the Porsche and began to run it up to temperature, hoping that it'd all be good. The fan has got clearance now. Get in. We're hoping we'll be okay. I'm not sure why the fan comes on straight away. That one's on as well. Nice and cool, eh? See the bubbles coming out, so I feel like it is self-leading. 
Yeah. Bubble in. I went to grab the diagnostic tool because I wanted to plug it in to see if we had any engine faults with the car. Because there was a few lights on the dash. A few warning lights. We've got engine management light, um, restraint system light, well, airbag light, and that is probably because, oh, that seatbelt's locked out. We need a seatbelt. That airbag's gone and that airbag's gone. And I didn't realize about that seatbelt. But, oh, that seatbelt's locked out as well. I then found sport mode. Whoa. But before I got a chance to read the codes on the car, the coolant temperature started to rise. It seems the coolant started to run through the system, so it needed topping up. And as the car started to run to temperature, the fans started to pick up their speed. And remember the stones that we cleared out at the start? Well, it seems I didn't clear them all out. Whoa! 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 And the fan started going ballistic, throwing stones all around the unit. In there. I don't know, <laughs> oh my god, that is not good. That is a danger fan. <laughs> what? Oh my god, is that all, all this? All that's just come out of it. And oh, it's bit oh, 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 no. oh no. Oh, it's oh, flinged it's, a stone it's, into yeah, it, isn't it? <laughs> wow. So that's blue radiator. Nice. Lesson learned. Make sure your radiators are clear of any debris before they go on because that has pile drive the radiator. It turns out these Porsches like to airlock in the coolant system and you're supposed to vacuum fill the coolant. And if you don't, the car will think it is overheating because of the airlock and spin the fans into warp speed. And if you've got stones going in your fan, well, that's a whole different problem. Well, I really hope that this car isn't gonna be one of them that is three steps forward and then another four steps backwards because that's exactly what we've just done this radiator wasn't even damaged but now it is and that seems like it's around a well a 600 pound mistake but with projects like this i've got to expect the unexpected but we're just going to crack on and i guess i'll see you guys in the next video thanks for watching this video if you've enjoyed it hit that subscribe button hit that thumbs up button and i'll see you in the next video peace out What's it firing? You like a truck there.